Hello everyone, my name is Dave Landry and this is the Week in Charts for Thursday, June 25th, 2015. What are we going to talk about? Well, I want to talk about trading psychology, and I'm not going to bore you guys who were just here before we hit record, but um, I've been doing a course uh, on trading psychology, I've been working on it, and I thought it would be something quick and easy, and then it became uh, more and more and more, and I think it's going to be, uh, I hope to be my masterpiece when it comes to to trading. So today I want to talk about uh, one aspect of that. I want to talk about the lizard brain, and that's going to make a lot more sense in just one second. And the fact that we need to be process-oriented because of the way the brain actually works. So I think by, without becoming a neuroscientist, which which I'm not, even though I did sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but without getting into that detail of things that I, I don't want to pretend I even understand, I I sort of understand on the surface what happens and I think that's all you have to to do in order to wrap your head around how your brain works from a scientific standpoint and embrace that now if you have any questions on anything or other than this or, or trading uh, start thinking about those now and if we have time we'll cover them and worst case we'll um, we'll cover it in coming weeks so start thinking about that now. Um, if you don't mind, while we're on the slides, let's keep the questions on the slides. And then once we get to the live charts, uh, we can start asking about individual stocks. Just ask about each stock, one stock at a time, and then hit carriage return. And that way I can cover your stock and hit delete. All right. Before I get too far into what I'm going to tell you about, let's just jump right in. The... Decision, decision part of the brain is your limbic system. And all decisions have to pass through the amygdala. And the amygdala is the emotional part of your brain. Well, the whole limbic system, I guess, could be seen as an emotional part of your brain. Carriage return, that's funny. Uh, enter, hit enter. <laughs> I'm, I'm such an old fart. Remember the old typewriters? You had a carriage return because it was the carriage that got returned. Hit enter. But the decision part of your brain is, is your limbic system, which is a very small part of your brain compared to the rest of your body. And the amygdala is the little emotional part here. And this is where all your decisions come from, or at least pass through when it comes to your brain. And it's been proven, and uh, Denise Schull talked about this, and uh, Damasio is another person who's done a lot of um, uh, research on it. And I think uh, Scholl's research actually comes from Damasio. And his name is Antonio Damasio. And the name of his book is uh, The Socrates Era. It's Emotion, Reason, and the Human Brain. Anyway, and his research and, and some of the research mentioned by Scholl suggests that if you were to have the unfortunate accident of, of having your brain damaged or unfortunately if you had some sort of cancer or something that affected this part of your brain it would be impossible to actually make decisions so each decision has an emotional um, detachment not not detachment i should say attachment to it and they cannot be detached from one another and the point I'm trying to illustrate with this is that this part of your brain, and it actually is two little um, almond-shaped parts of this limbic system, is very small relative to the rest of your brain. Now, again, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but from um, a little Googling, it appears that your entire left, um, I guess, cerebrum is your decision-making part of your brain, and then the other parts of your brain contribute to that, too. So... You've got this very little part of your brain that is making decisions for you or at least making snap decisions, and this is your emotional part of your brain. Now, these snap decisions are very good in certain situations. So this is great for a flight or a fight type of situation, okay? Am I going to get eaten? 
or should I just run away, or I think I got this. You need that snap decision in a case like this. Now, I don't want to get too philosophical on you, but some of the research I've been doing is pointing out the fact that we haven't evolved that much in time. So 10,000 years, if that's the case, back where, you, where that flight of fight was incredibly important, we haven't evolved much during that time. And on the evolutionary scale, it takes a long, long, long time to evolve. And even in everyday life, there are some situations where you still need that snap decision, that snap emotional decision made by the amygdala. Okay. So it's really good back in caveman times. Okay. And then in current times, in trading at least, not so much. So let's look at what happens when you make. A decision and again I'm not a neuroscientist so this is the way I sort of wrap my head around it and I think I think I'm I think I got it pretty close here so you have this emotional part of your brain and it's a little bitty part okay the amygdala and you can make a really quick decision so you have a decision to make and you can make a decision just like this. Just go straight in, bam, emotional decision, and you're done. If you give yourself time, or I should say the more time that you give yourself, the more time that little emotional part of your brain is allowed to react with the majority of the rest of your brain. And you get a back and forth type of feedback type of mechanism. And then there's an emotion evolved from the perceived consequence. Now, by that I mean, as I said earlier, from Damasio and Scholl and, and research of others, if that emotional part of your brain is damaged, you cannot make a decision. Okay, you ask somebody, well, would you like to meet next week? If a physician asks the patient, with that problem, okay, unfortunate problem, it says, would you like to meet next Tuesday or Wednesday? They can go through all the logical reasons why they should meet on Tuesday and then all the logical reasons of why they should meet on Wednesday. But if there's no emotion between the two, the final decision cannot be made. And unfortunately, they'll go back through the list over and over again, and they can never come to a conclusion because there's there's no emotion involved with that decision one day doesn't have a consequence above the other one day might not one day might have some conflicts or you might have to you have some something already planned or something you want to do or whatever and it, it has to have some sort of consequence some sort of emotional consequence I should say in order for you to make that decision but the point I'm going to try to make today is that the more time you could give yourself in the decision-making process, and as we'll see, it might not necessarily have to be that much time, but the more time we could move in this direction, the further we can get into the logical part of our brain to help us make the decisions. And I, I kind of see this uh, amygdala as the, as the gatekeeper, okay? We still have to go through the gatekeeper, but if we're making decisions – here, they're going to be much more impulsive than if we're making them back here, okay? So the point I want to make today is you want to be more process-oriented at what you're doing, and then I'm going to say versus goal-oriented, okay? And in the process orientation, you're, you're following a process which is going to help to – I don't want to use the word eliminate because you cannot eliminate your emotions, but to sort of embrace – your emotions. So let's look at the process versus goal-oriented things when it comes to trading. Now keep in mind that in trend trading, the true goal is really unknown. We want to be with a market for a long, long time, at least as long as it appears to be trending and has not ended. Now this trend might continue for weeks, for months, or even years. Unfortunately, or not. 
Therefore, we must have a process in place to stay with it if it does and exit if it doesn't. Now, although all decisions are emotionally based, emotionally charged decisions, and maybe that's what you, we should uh, focus on, is that we want to not eliminate our emotions but embrace them and control maybe the charged portion of those decisions. So when the stress is high, and this could be because either time constraints or high stakes or involved. So this time constraint thing, and this is um, from Montier, and this is uh, from um, a little book of behavioral finance, I think is where that came from. Uh, I'm sorry, a little book of behavioral investing. And uh, he's quoted research from Klein on this. And these are direct quotes straight from the book. So it was stress is high because either the time constraints or high stakes or involved, or high stakes are involved. So the time constraints, that's the point I was making earlier, is that you're going to make these emotionally charged decisions when you are trying to make that decision as fast as possible over here. You're going to be more on the impulse side of this. Obviously, advertisers know a whole lot about how to um, make us part with our money through these emotionally charged decisions. And keep in mind that, and I don't want to pick on the day traders too much, but the point I'm going to make here is that you're going to be forced to make a lot more decisions in the heat of battle if you're day trading versus if you're position trading. Now, position trading, in my case, would be a swing trade, a, a trade over a few days where you think the market has the potential to make a nice move over a few days. And then hopefully hang on to that trade for a long, long time, weeks, months, maybe even years if that trend develops. So that kind of dovetails into the other thing is when the information is incomplete, ambiguous, or changing. Well, if you're trying to day trade, that information obviously is constantly day trading, and you're making more and more decisions. And with each decision comes into motion. And I think we're only capable of making so many decisions, especially during the heat of battle. Okay. So he says when information is incomplete, ambiguous, or changing, and when goals are ill-defined, shifting, or competing. Well, when you're looking at a goal and trading, you you will have your initial profit target if you're doing my methodology. And then that other goal is hopefully unlimited, okay? And obviously there will be some limits to it. And sooner or later you will get stopped out. That's a given. But you have to realize that it's – by following the process to get there, to get to the ultimate goal and not worry so much about the goal because the ultimate outcome is uncertain. And when the ultimate outcome is uncertain, this does add to your emotionally charged decisions. So it was kind of interesting. I went in to get, um, I actually eat lunch, went in the house to eat lunch and, uh, not lunch, what am I talking about? Breakfast, <laughs> right before the show. And my daughter was watching Brain Games, and it's kind of interesting. And they started talking about uh, choosing ice creams. If you were, if you have a choice between three ice creams, or a hundred ice creams, or whatever the number may be, it's actually a much easier choice, obviously, to choose three. And you'll actually be probably happier with just three choices: uh, vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate, as opposed to all these different choices. Because the more decisions you're faced with the more stress than anxiety occurs and i'm guessing his uh, research is coming from i just did a quick uh, look this I looked this up quickly it looks on amazon there's a book called the paradox of choice and i just uh, took from the description and i think it pretty much sums it up schwartz makes a counterintuitive case that eliminating choices can greatly excuse reduce stress anxiety and the busyness of our lives so if you're faced with less choices during the heat of battle, if you have everything planned out, if you're following the process, then things become a lot easier for you. The stress level goes down. You have to manage your stress. You have to manage the emotionally charged nature of everything because we have to embrace our emotions because we now know that that little part of our brain that's controlling the emotions 
is also controlling our decision making process. Now we can do some things to make better decisions and to interject more logic into that equation. But the bottom line is we're going to have to embrace our emotions and do whatever it takes to lower that stress level and to do the right thing. And again, be process oriented, just follow the process. Now, I wasn't sure how to fit this in today's presentation uh, due to the time constraints, putting everything together. But it's kind of interesting. Uh, Greg Morris, when he does some talks on psych training psychology, one of the things that comes up uh, quite often is is a, a pilot's checklist. Greg was a fighter pilot back in um, Vietnam, and um, he's also a Top Gun trainer, I think, too. And there's a lot of checklists that occur when you fly. And what's kind of interesting is, as Greg pointed out, everything on that checklist has actually happened. People have landed a plane without putting the landing gear down. So it's kind of like, don't do that. Well, it, it has to become part of the plan, part of the process to stop that from being done. But I'll figure out a way to incorporate that in. And I just want to throw that in as part of the thing. Now, my whole deal is when I'm looking at charts at the end of the day, and truth be told, if, when I'm looking at charts intraday, I mean, I was looking at everything right before the show. I get a little emotionally charged, and I, I try to become less and less emotionally charged. But the more I look at it, the more I focus on it, the more stressed out I become. And I know that my looking at it is not going to change the outcome. I have no control over the outcome. That no control, again, brings up the emotional charge nature. But at the end of the day, 3 o'clock Central Time, 4 o'clock Eastern, I get that big cup of coffee and I start looking at my charts and it's, it's a, it's a fascinating for me. I'm not emotional when I'm looking at those charts. The market is not open. Things aren't moving around. I can see what happened and I can plan accordingly. As I've said a thousand times before, I look at my quote screen. I've seen, it's fully red or mostly red. I'm mostly long. I get pissed off, I drop some F-bombs, I go walk around the block, come back all sweaty, and then the screen turns green. Okay, now my walking around the block had nothing to do with that, obviously. But the point is that I wasted all that mental energy, and then the market turned around. Now, it doesn't always turn around, obviously, but the more you look at it, the more you're obsessing over it, it isn't going to move more in your favor. So you need to obsess before you get into a trade down afterwards. So the plan is done before the heat of battle because once the information begins to change, you can't make a change, uh, um, changes. You can't fly by the seat of your pants, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Although many people do. And I think that that keeps you from, I don't want to digress too far, but I, I think that takes, that keeps you from, claiming responsibility for your actions. If you don't have a stop in place ahead of time, then you could let that market go as far against you. It could go, it could just keep going against you forever. And you never have to admit you're wrong unless of course you run out of money or your broker calls you to put more money in your account. You never have to admit you're wrong as long as that trade is open. Okay. And there is no such thing as a paper loss. A loss is a loss, okay? You can't take those, I think I wrote in one of my books, you can't take those that portfolio to the bank that used to be worth a million dollars and now only worth $100,000 and say, hey, I have a million dollars worth of stocks here. And they look at it and says, well, it looks like they're only worth 100000 No, 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 but they'll, they'll come back. They'll be worth that at some point. So that's, that's not the reality. Reality is you have the loss. So you have to have that plan in place and you can't fly by the seat of your pants and everybody wants to because nobody wants to admit that it could be wrong. The moment, as I said before, the moment you put a stop in place, the moment you plan for that stop, you plan or you admit, I should say, that you could be wrong. But getting back to the aftermarket analysis, 
sitting back with my big cup of coffee. I'm looking at charts. Ooh, that looks good. I think that has potential. I do get a little excited about them, but I'm not emotionally charged in the decision-making process at that point. So, okay, where would be a good spot to get in? Where would be a good spot to um, to get out at a partial profit? And 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 by determining that, or by by starting the opposite way, where would be a spot where I would be wrong? I could determine where that initial profit target should be. And I map out that plan. And all I have to do, I know, ha ha, is follow that plan. But I want to obsess before I get into a trade, not afterward. As, as I've shown a thousand times before, when you're looking at that chart and the market's closed, all the information in the world is available to you. You can look back in time as far as you want. You could see everything that's happened in the chart. Okay. You can see if, if there, is there overhead resistance? Has the stock been trending nicely? Is the trend accelerating or decelerating? Does the stock trade cleanly? Or does it look like electrocardiogram? All these things I preach every week about stock selection. All of that is known, but the moment you actually place the trade and that trade triggers in, then you're stepping into the unknown. And that's why you have to obsess before you get into the trade and then afterwards and have a plan in place. Now, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is how to train your brain, how to trick your brain. Okay. And without being a neuroscientist, just understanding how that amygdala, that limbic system as part of the limbic system works in relation to the rest of your brain, which is uh, the logical makeup of the rest of your brain, can help you in your decision-making process. Now, one way you can reduce your emotionally charged decisions is by reducing your size. I met a trader a while back, and I told him, I said, you seem to have become successful pretty quick. And he goes, well, Dave, I'm, I'm risking like $25 a trade. Now, I'm not sure what type of trading he was doing that would allow such small sizes, but that's how he did it. He was risking so little on each trade that it didn't really matter to him. It was barely, a, you know, a, a lunch money, you know, <laughs> type of trade. So if you are having emotional problems, then you need to reduce your share size down. Now, let's back this up just a little bit. And this is a whole other topic we could spend a lot of time on. But all of this psychological talk here is under the assumption that you already have developed a methodology or you have embraced someone else's methodology and that's what you're doing. Um, I don't want to pick on anyone more recently because it's a very common email that I get, but I got an email a few days ago. It's like, uh, you know, I, I trade pullbacks and I'm pretty straightforward in what I do and how I do it. And then I get a lot of emails that are like, okay, Dave, well, what if I did this and did this and I put a moving average in and we did this and put an oscillator in and I'm working on the system and all that's great, but you need to define that system and have your own system. And if you want to use my stuff, that's great. There's some guys here that that do things a little bit differently than me, but my momentum-based stuff dovetails in. So they're able to take what they do and take what I do, and my stocks are very similar, and they trade their own system. But the point is you can't be trading when you're still developing your system. You're still trying to wrap your head around your methodology or even someone else's for that matter. So my answer is like, whoa, you're confusing me. I've spent 20 something years working on and perfecting my methodology and you need to either do two things. One, follow along with me or two, develop your own methodology and if it dovetails in what, what I'm doing, like the aforementioned clients, then by all means, do what you do and then use me to provide you with some ancillary research, maybe some stocks you didn't see that might also fit your methodology. So the, the big talk about embracing your emotions, 
Solving for that, a big part of that is going to be to make sure you have a viable methodology in place that makes sense to you and you're not trying to create a methodology on the fly because that's just going to create even more problems. So I guess I should have started off by saying we're, you know, we're kind of at step two. Step one is make sure you have a viable methodology, something that you studied intensely and paper traded, and that's why I always say I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Now, one guy did come up to me after speech that he was unsuccessful, but he's only been at it for a few months. So the caveat is anyone who has carefully studied trading, <laughs> I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader who has carefully studied trading for a considerable amount of time. It's when the real money goes on the line. So this reduce your mostly charged decisions by reducing your size, that's by that's saying, first of all, you've already discovered a system that you like and you're going to follow and paper traded it to a point where you feel pretty good. But if you're unsuccessful at a larger size, back off on your size. If you're not following your rules, I should say, at a larger size, and back off on your size until you can. Okay. And I often talk about the importance of money management, the methodology, and your mind when it comes to making a trade. Money management, as I often say, could cure a multitude of sins. If you're only risking a small amount on any given trade, and it's such an in insignificant amount, you shouldn't let your you should not let, let yourself you should not let yourself become emotionally charged. By that, or if it, even if it does, you should recognize that you're getting emotionally charged by that. Again, slow that decision-making process down. Follow the process, and realize like, okay, well, I'm only going to lose so much, so I'm going to follow my plan. And then it's like a muscle; you need to slowly build from there, then slowly increase your position size. Now, I don't want to get too far bogged down into the money management and as it relates to the emotionally charged decision process. But let's just say you're risking one quarter percent of your account on every trade. Well, once you become successful at one quarter percent, don't jump up to the 2% maximum that I preach, okay? Go maybe up to one half percent and then build that muscle a little bit more and get better and better until you're successful at one half percent and then slowly bump it up. The problem is if you bump it up from one quarter to 2% overnight, and there's two things that can happen. Your next couple of trades might look like this, and you print money, and you'll start feeling like God. Or the next couple of two, couple of trades may look like this, two or three trades, whatever. And now you're losing 2%, 2%, 2%. So now you're losing a lot, lot more money. You're losing four times the amount of money you would have before. So here you might feel like God, and here you might feel like somebody needs to go out and flip burgers. Okay? But if you just kind of bump that size up, and if you get a few winners in a row or a few losers in a row, it won't go to your head as much. So you have to bump that size slowly. You have to work that muscle until you get, until you acclimate everything and adjust up to a higher share size. And the other thing too, and again, not to digress too far, don't start at a quarter percent and say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and jump to 2% because I'm successful. And then you get whacked on the trade, so you lose 2%. So now you're down 2%. So oh, better go back to one quarter percent. Okay, so you're at one quarter percent. And then let's say you make a little bit of this trade. Okay. Well, now you've lost four times the amount before, and this time you're only going to make one quarter of the amount. So it's going to take four trades to make up for this loss. So you start winning. Oh, look, I'm winning again. So, you know, say you make one or two trades, you're winning. Well, let me jump back to 2% and then you lose. Okay, now you got to make like 6 or 7%, 6 or 7 times in a row at a quarter percent. So the point is you have to be consistent, whether it's a quarter percent or 2%. If you can trade at 2% and you're successful and you can avoid making these emotionally charged decisions, then stay at 2%. If not... Reduce it down to a size where you're comfortable. Stay at that size until you become comfortable and successful, and then bump it up. 
Now, I think slowing down the brain is a very important thing for us to do. Obviously, if you're getting attacked, if a bear is coming after you, you don't want to sit around and and contemplate your navel. You want to let that that limbic system, that little part of your brain, kick in and 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 get out of there, or figure out a way to figure out what you're going to do quickly, fly to fight. But if you do ask yourself what, at every decision when it comes to trading, well, what's the plan, Stan? So. I get emails all the time. What should I do with this stock? It's probably the most common email I get. Well, what was the plan? Um, in the service all the time, like going into a stock, I lay out everything that needs to be done. Here's your stock. Here's your entry. Here's your stop if triggered. And here's the additional profit target. And we're going to – every day I'm going to tell you where that stop should go if there's any changes in it at all. Laid out the entire plan every day. Dave, where, where should I get in this stock? Well, you have an entry. Well, where should I place a stop? You have a stop. You place it where I told you to place it. Well, I missed this one. Well, why did you take it? Well, uh, I don't know. I didn't like it at the time, whatever. But now I want to get in. Well, now you're faced with another decision. And the more decisions you're faced with, and now you've got a moving target. Okay, stock's up five points from where I said to get in. If you get in now, what's your plan? You don't have a plan. So no matter how much I do the planning, people can't follow the plan. And then it's like, as, as much as I preach of, preach, following the plan I get emails all the time from people in stocks that are down 20 points 30 points sometimes 50 points from where they got in and my question is always what was your plan well obviously they don't have one I'm trying to make them admit that they don't have one but on the next trade on the next 100 trades on the next 1000 trades you need to have a plan going in again obsess before you get into the market not afterwards so always ask yourself what's the plan and this is one way you can kind of slow yourself down it's kind of like, what should I do? You're in a trade, like, well, what should I do? And don't say, oh, I'm up a bunch of money. I better take that money so it doesn't evaporate. You monetize that large amount of money. It, it, one thing that's kind of interesting is I, I never really thought about it, but there are good problems to have in trading, but there's still problems nonetheless. You're up a bunch in a position. You're like, well, I better lock that in. I better lock it in 100% gain. Well, as I preach, if you lock it in 100%, you'll never get 200%. And if you lock it at 200%, you never get 400%, and so on and so forth. So would you find yourself at that, let's say it's a good problem to have, you're up 100%, and you feel feeling the urge to take that 100% off the table. Now, I'm assuming that you already took partial profits like we discussed or we often discuss whenever we enter trade, you're, there's always a partial profit goal in mind just in case things don't materialize, and I can elaborate on that in a few minutes. But the bottom line is, provided you already took the partial profits and you're trailing that stop higher, and that's your plan, then you need to follow your plan. So if you're up 100% and you think, oh, uh, let me think what I should do. While well, you're making that decision or the heat of battle, things are changing, all those problems I talked about earlier are beginning to rear their ugly head, and you're monetizing those gains, mentally monetizing, I should say, at that point, you need to stop and say, what's the plan? So you need to actually maybe slow your brain down. I was thinking about this right before the show, by physically referring to the plan. And I think that probably a good thing to do would be to print out your actual, actual trading plan that had a stop in it, an initial goal, and not just use an electronic spreadsheet or something. Actually have a physical piece of paper that you actually have to reach for, grab, and look at. And that's going to involve multiple parts of your brain. It's also going to slow down that, that little lizard, lizard brain system that we all have to work through. And you say, oh, well, the stop is here. 
So a lot of people, a lot of times people ask what to do with this stock. Well, the stop is here. If it's something I recommended the last night, I, the stop was there. That's what you should do. Well, Dave, it's gone sideways. What should I do? Well, my belief is that you don't exit a trade until you stopped out. As many times as I've put out a dead money report, as soon as a stock does underperforms a little bit or doesn't take go straight up, I get emails. Dave, we should exit. It's not doing anything. Well, you know, do what you want. Okay, but the original plan, the original system is to stick with it until proven right or wrong. And then the emails come in. Well, how long? I don't know. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Okay. Obviously, you're going to get stopped out long before then. But you have to follow the plan. And you can't let the new decisions come into place just because the market is not cooperating with you and operating on your time frame. Now, the question is, one thing I was thinking about is, but wait, if things are really crazy, will I have time? So if things are kind of going a little crazy in the market, will you have time to refer to that plan to slow your brain down, to, to, to get to the logic part of what should be done and, and kind of settle down those emotions a little bit? And it, it seems like maybe the heat of battle you won't, but all it takes is a few seconds, believe it or not, okay? How many times, and I was guilty of this over the weekend, um, and I think we all are, but how many times have you kind of snapped back at your spouse and said something emotionally and then... You're like, oh, uh, I shouldn't have said that. And, but that comes out like like that. Well, it's been proven that if you could just slow your brain down two or three seconds, if you could just say count to three maybe on every decision, and I know it's not easy, okay? But it's like you have this little – they push a little button, and that little trigger immediately poof, evokes this emotional response. But if you could slow your brain down just a little bit, you only need a few seconds. Uh, Google, I read about this a while back, or Gmail, which I think Google owns. Uh, yeah, Google owns Gmail. I don't know if the feature's back in or not. Maybe somebody, I have Gmail, but I don't use it that much. I just use it to collect stuff from forums and all, which I eventually get around reading, or I claim to, that I'll read someday. So I don't know. So if somebody has Gmail, let me know if they uh, they have this feature back in place. They tested it a few years back, and I don't remember where I read this, but the feature gave you like 30 seconds after you hit send on an email to change your mind. And I don't have the exact statist statistics, easy for me to say, as to how many – emails were undone okay or hit that undo key but it was a lot it was like an overwhelming number i think it was like like something ridiculous like 70 percent of the emails because the person was given that few seconds to think do i really want to send that email okay what what i do if i ever find myself in a pissed off response in an email is I write that three page nasty gram and then I I save it to drafts and that slows my brain down a little bit and then I chill out a little bit go get a cup of coffee have lunch or whatever and then after lunch 99.9% .9 of the time I delete that email <laughs> okay so they proved or, or, or these uh, neuroscientists, I guess, or psychologists, got all excited about this, uh, this evidence, this statistical evidence about how we'll change our mind if we're given the time to, to reason things out. So we do make these snap decisions, but we can undo that by just slowing down a little bit in our decision-making process. So, you know, count to three before a reply to your significant other 
and your life will get a lot better. I mean, it's it's not if they're asking you what you want for dinner or something like that. But if they if you feel that little trigger hit you, something that kind of makes you immediately mad or this this you feel that emotionally charged response coming out, count to three, okay? And that's going to slow your brain down enough to get into that logic part of the brain. And, t and the logic part of the brain is to tell that little amygdala to, hey, chill out here, you know, because, cause, uh, you know, what's the old country song? Uh, too hot too hot to golf, uh, too hot to fish, and uh, too cold at home, you know. So that, that quick little, little snapback could cost you a few days. And it kind of always reminds me of the uh, the Terminator thing. And I scraped this off of uh, YouTube, so I don't know how to give pr proper uh, uh, credit. But this was from the first Terminator. And the guy says, uh, hey, buddy, you got a dead cat in there or what? And the Terminator is in the, in the room. And the Terminator, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a robot inside of Arnold Schwarzenegger's body who comes back from the future to kill someone who was going to, I don't know, do something in the, in the past or however it goes. He gets mixed up pretty quick. But his human body was rotting away uh, with the robot underneath. And uh, so he's, he's in this, he's in someone's apartment going through a diary to find out where she is or a phone book or whatever. And the landlord knocks on the door is like, hey, buddy, you got a dead cat in there or what? And then the little computer noise comes up. And uh, by the way, I've never had a computer that actually made that that computer noise. Has any, anybody ever have a computer that makes that noise when they process? But every time, like on all these uh, crime shows on TV, whenever they pull up the computer, it's always making this little noise, which I always found kind of interesting. But anyway, this is what's going on inside his head. And he has the possible responses. So. This is a little trick I play, and sometimes it's kind of fun. And, and it, like my wife and I are telling stories, like something happens, and it, you can almost see this little computer screen come up in your in your head, just like the uh, Terminator. So his answers were yes, no, or what? Go away, please come back later. And then obviously these two down here. And I remember the whole theater erupted in laughter when he chose this one here. Now, that might be the appropriate response, okay? <laughs> and it might be worth it. I don't know. Given the situation, sometimes sometimes that's the appropriate response. But the point I'm trying to make, and believe it or not, I do have one, is if you slow yourself down and let your logic part of your brain kind of wake up a little bit, you're not going to make those emotionally charged decisions. And, and you refer back to the original plan and just follow the original plan. So try that little Terminator type of thinking. Now, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately is excite the amygdala ahead of time by reward for following the plan. Okay? Just do this exercise if you're having any trouble trading. On your next trade, on your next five trades, or your next ten trades, Provided, of course, you got a viable methodology in place, okay? Sometimes the market just gets choppy. Trend following just doesn't work too well, okay? You have to wrap your head around it. That's another, that's another lecture in and of itself. That goes to the methodology and, and wrapping your head around that. But assuming you know all these things, and if you're just making these emotionally charged decisions, then do this. Follow the plan. Follow the exact plan. Now, regardless of the out outcome, good, bad, or indifferent, you're going to reward yourself if you follow the plan. Now, if you didn't follow the plan and make money, that doesn't count. You have to follow the plan and reward yourself. And think about that reward. So, and I'm not saying go out and buy a, a new convertible. I'm saying treat yourself, although it might be cheaper to do that than to continue to lose all your money trading. But just a small little reward, something that might excite you, a, a good meal, okay, or treat yourself to a round of golf, maybe treat yourself to massage. Obviously, you ladies, treat yourself to uh, something that you're not very excited about doing, like your own pedicure or whatever. Treat yourself to a pedicure, okay. 
do something, and it could be something small. It doesn't have to be something major, but do something small and know ahead of time you're going to do that if you follow your plan. And this is going to slow down your brain a little bit too and help you make that right decision. Like, oh, wait a minute. If I follow that plan, I'm going to get that, uh, I'm going to go to my favorite restaurant, okay? Or I'm going to go play golf or go fishing or whatever, get a massage, pedicure. And it also brings you back to the process. So again, you want to be process oriented. So it'll bring you back to the process. The other thing that I've been doing over the last couple of years since I've learned about this emotional, these emotionally based decisions, and all decisions are really emotionally based. If you boil it all down, it's all got to th go through that little, the little gatekeeper in there, okay? That amygdala is I've I've started embracing and recognizing and becoming very cognizant of all of my emotions in everyday life. My lunch choice, man, I really could go for some fried fish today. Okay, little gas station down the road's got some really good fried fish, fried catfish. Well, I've been having a bit of a sodium issue lately. My doctor's on my ass. I've got some issues, you know, and I don't want to get too far into that. But, okay, so now I'm thinking like, I start thinking, well, that's going to be high in sodium, and I'm not supposed to have the sodium. And it, it then it becomes, it's the emotions of the excitement of that good, that good taste in catfish, that wonderfully fried catfish, and how great that's going to taste as opposed to the repercussions and the emotions involved with it. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but the point is just embrace your emotions to exercise or not. You're like, oh, you know, just, just think of the feelings that you're kind of going through when you're going through these mental choices, okay? And the more you learn to embrace your emotions in everyday life and recognize those emotions are in control and – to some extent, controlling you, the better off you're going to be when it comes to trading, okay? Chase says, I find it much easier for me to follow your plan when it's my own and I find myself tweaking it and make a mess. This is a new weird for me. This is new weird for me. Well, I, 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 think, I think that experience will – you have to be careful if you're – and this is where we could go off on, on, on quite a tangent on this too. I think it's human nature to take something that works and mess it up. Okay. But what you have to do is make sure you have something that you think that works as good or better that dovetails in with my stuff. Okay. Make sure that my stuff could help your stuff provided you've already you already are successful with it okay so you don't want to come in and try to tweak things too much now on the other side of the coin where I'm going with this is you also don't want to you also don't want to play the blame game years ago I was going through a period of time where I was struggling quite a bit and I said well I'm just gonna follow this one person's system and if I lose money, I'm going to blame them. It's like, no. You know, I, I realized what I was doing there. I was trying to put the blame on somebody else. But the, blame, the ultimate blame goes on you, whether you're following someone's system or not. So it's okay to – I don't want to stifle anyone's research. But you can't take research and trade it on the fly. I got a call from someone a while back, a friend of mine, who I met in the industry many years ago and this was this was probably 20 years ago and it's like um hey dave i'm long and i forget what it was it might have been back way back in the commodity trading days but he was long he was long something i, I can't remember what i'm like oh okay well, why are you long that well i'm trading this number counting system it's literally a number counting system and i don't want to go there because i think it's i think it's total bs but i, I would digress if i went much further Anyway, I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting because I thought it was kind of a strange, kind of difficult thing to wrap your head around, and I, I didn't get it, okay? And I'm like, okay, well, how long have you been doing that? Well, I just read it a few minutes ago. So he read something in a book, saw it on a screen, and then put his hard-earned hard dollars at risk. 
Now, this system may work. I don't know. But to me, it looks so complex. And it seemed like there was always an excuse. It seemed like if you had a signal and it didn't work, well, it was really – count was wrong. You got to start your count over, and you got to go back to one, and then it's a new count because of this. But if the signal worked, yeah, oh, that was a, le that was a legitimate count. Yeah, it worked. You know, It kind of seemed like <laughs> one of those things where if it worked, you look like a genius, and if it didn't work, you could blame it on the fact that the count was wrong which is great for selling a system because your end user never would get it. I, I was helping somebody once and they were publishing something. I probably shouldn't say this, but I said, you're being a little ambiguous. And he's like, he's like, I don't care. So that tells me that person, it wants to keep, wants to be aloof out there. And it seems like you, if you look at some of these people who sell these systems that are kind of impossible to, to ever follow, it's like they sell them for a lot of money and they keep it kind of ambiguous as opposed to Big Dave out there drawing a big arrow on the screen and saying, do this and do that. <laughs> but the point is, you don't want to create something on the fly. You want to make sure you've got a couple hundred or even a thousand paper trades under your belt, and then maybe a, maybe a few hundred real trades under your belt over a variety of conditions. you got to be very careful what your system developing that you're not creating an aberration. That's my big problem with mechanical systems because I've been there and done that, okay? But if you get a system that prints money on a mechanical basis and you go try to use it in real markets, you're in for a rude awakening because you have identified an aberration. I do this weekly host uh, for timing research and have been doing it for about six months or so, maybe a little longer, where we have an expert panel. And we talk about the market and what's going on and, and um, what things we think are going to influence the market this week. And it was kind of interesting. I think it was last week's or on Monday, somebody had written uh, how much money they're making selling calls or selling options. OK, well, that's great because the market has been stuck in a sideways range. And if you're selling options, OK. And as long as the market stays in a range, the options you're selling are going to expire worthless and you're going to make money. So as long as this happens, you're going to make money. But if the market takes off and does that, not only are you going to lose money, you're going to lose probably all you just made. Okay, to each his own. Okay, I'm not going to, I don't want to beat up you guys who, who sell options. If that's what you do, then that's what you do, as long as you've got your head wrapped around it and you can stand the emotional, you, 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 your brain says, I need that constant reward, and occasionally I'm going to get whacked and be really depressed for two days, and provided my account isn't completely wiped out, I know I can go back to the market to do it again. If, you, if that's how you're made, if that's how you're wired, then, then God bless you, okay? But just make sure what you've observed is not an aberration, and make sure it works in all markets. And you, you hate to be, you know, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. But you hate to be a pessimist, but it seems like the longer you're in this industry, the more you think what could go wrong as opposed to the excitement of what could go right. And it's kind of a bummer, but I think that's very important. So if you are selling those options or if you have identified some sort of system that's printing money, just make sure that it won't always be that way, okay? Phil says, on noise, how do they record explosions in space? As there is no atmosphere... There should be no sound. Okay. All right, Phil, you might have to break the joint in half. You lost me on that one. <laughs> on noise, how do they record explosions in space? As there's no atmosphere, there should be no sound. Where are you going with that, buddy? Phil lost me. All right, Leon says, Google's introduced the feature of Gmail up to 30 seconds on Unsend, but only on desktop mail, not Gmail app. Okay, so they brought back the, the, the Gmail thing. And it'd be interesting to see what the statistics are going to be on those re on those uh, unsent emails because the emotions will kick in. Okay, I think that's enough pontification on uh, psychology. Any other questions, thoughts, complaints? I'm using antidotes. Um, still have my special up and running on my service. If you scroll down on the service page, there's a um, – $7 introductory order, that is still uh, in place. 
there this webinar is old I do have a webinar on Tuesday and what day is Tuesday anybody know um, it's uh, just keep an eye on my website so next Tuesday there's gonna be a webinar and I'm gonna get back to IPOs so if you get a chance uh, check out the uh, countdowns on my website I'll get it put up uh, later today on that okay and of course check out my store go to products on the home page or go to this direct link all right let's hop into the charts and I want to take a look at the overall market first and then I want to take a look at the sectors and then of course let's let's we'll take a look at your individual stock picks so start giving me your stock picks now and as soon as we get through covering the market we'll get to those one thing I've observed with this market is every time it goes down it comes right back unfortunately every time it comes right back it goes down so in other words it's been pretty choppy in here one of the most important things you could do and again maybe slow yourself down and physically run this little program in here or physically draw a trend line I know I could just hit my little C key and drag the curse of forward this gives me a custom date sort this is a relative strength sort which is kind of useful if you want to mess around with sectors and all okay but 90% of the time I just do I just use it to see where the market was and where the market is on a net net basis so we're down a smidge since February okay and you can back the chart even further out and just kind of draw you a line in here make that line about where the closing price is or the current price is and then go back in time so it's safe to say since last year late last year we really have made a whole lot of forward progress so the market's going sideways so this is not good for a trend follower uh, luckily and I hate to use the word luck but luckily we've been finding some opportunities since last fall okay knock on wood but as a general statement markets going sideways so at the least you want to be super duper selective while the market is going sideways now here's a good thing if you take a look at the 200 day moving average if you go back a couple of columns I talked about daylight I also did an article for proactive investor um, proactive advisor proactive advisor where I talked about daylight and daylight goes all the way back to the mid 90s where I did an article for stocks and commodities it was the first article I think I've written for a major magazine where I talked about the concept of daylight in, in the terms of a system the 220 EMA breakout system and then after that uh, system was published somebody coined the phrase daylight and daylight is the lows are greater than the moving average you can go back a couple of years in this market basis the P's you can see that the daylight's bit above that 200 day moving average now you don't want to rush out and trade this system as I preach quite often but uh, two things, two takeaways. One is everything works better with trends. So if a market's trending, a very simple trend following system, maybe the simplest of all is your best bet. Okay. And as I said in a column, two or three columns back, or maybe even last week or last uh, weeks, a few weeks ago, I've been in lectures where people will have like a hundred, maybe even a thousand buy and sell signals in this whole trend like this. It's like, well, you know, if you'd have just bought when you had a little daylight, okay and exited what you didn't you would have caught the majority of that trend and you wouldn't have 100 or 200 or a thousand buy and sell signals where net net you probably lost money by the time you figured out uh, frictional costs such as skittage and commissions so the point is everything works better with trend and if you're trying to outsmart the market and figure out if it is if it's a third of a fifth or a fifth of a third or if the counts on 12 or 13 or 15 or is it reset count just stop relax okay and ask yourself is there daylight above the 200 day moving average okay now eventually this daylight this uh, moving average if the market continues to chop sideways will catch up and yes it could just be a choppy sideways market which it has been in a media term but longer term you want to err on the side of the trend Notice the NASDAQ, nice daylight above the 50-day moving average. I'm sorry, 200-day moving average. Probably the 50, too. Let's put the 50 in for S&Gs. 
Just kind of doing this on the fly. Yeah, it's starting to break away from that 50-day moving average. Nice little daylight in here. So far, so good. The bottom line with the NASDAQ is, is that it did break out. And so far, it's just pulled back a little bit. Now, there's probably going to be fits and starts with the market. The market isn't going to go to straight line. And as I often preach, the market's going to do what it has to do to frustrate the most. A couple of Wall Street adages in here. I've got these from Linda Rasky, just full disclosure. And it's also going to do what – it's also going to do the obvious in the most unobvious manner. So if it's going up, it's going to have some pretty bad shakeouts to the downside along the way, and vice versa on the downside too. So this market is obviously breaking out, but of course it's going to come right back in, and maybe then it'll break out. Okay. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty, as you know, recently broke out, sold off hard yesterday, and today it's up a smidge in here. But so far, it's just kind of pulling back after breaking out. So far, so good there. And Rusty's just been abysmal as far as the sideways movement, but at least it's breaking out in here. Selected areas have been doing pretty good. The banks, especially regional banks, are up here at new highs, so that's kind of interesting. The energies are kind of selling off in here, and it sure looks like they want to go back and revisit their old lows. We caught a nice pop in an energy or two on this uh, last little run in here. But now is the time to step aside. I'm getting, I'm getting a few questions on energies. Hey, Dave, what do you think about this one or that one? It's like, well, let's just sit on our hands a little bit until this market can improve overall. Unless, again, the litmus test is, do you really, really, really like a setup? But if you do, and you can honestly say it fits your methodology, and, it's, it, and let's talk in terms of my methodology, or at least a trending methodology, if the market's really trending and it's looking pretty good, then by all means, go for it irregardless of what's going on in the sector. But ideally, you want the market to be headed higher, the sector to be he headed higher, and the stock to also be headed higher before you run, run out and buy it. Uh, we are long USO, full disclosure, in the model portfolio, and it hasn't done much lately. We did get that initial profit target out, and now we're just kind of sitting on our hands, waiting for something to happen. Hey, Dave, it's dead money. Well, it's okay. We'll sit on it until uh, until something happens. So we either get stopped out or to scratch, or it takes off. But right now it's going kind of sideways. So ideally, even though the energy still look like a major bottom to me, and energies to me, at least the oil, the underlying commodity, I should say, oil looks like an easy double. Okay, back up to these old highs in here. I would rush out and buy the energies until the underlying commodity can begin to prove itself again. Metals and mining I find very interesting. I'm kind of a gold bug at heart, I think. But I've learned to try to put those emotions aside a little bit and just believe in what I see and not in what I hope. So in the metals, you can see they've come down here and they're kind of scraping bottom again. And to me, it looks like it's going to be the mother of all triple bottoms. Now, the best thing you could do is read a lot about classical technical analysis and the second thing you next thing you could do is don't rush out and use any of it okay until you fully understand it and then make sure you have some sort of trigger because a double bottom could become a triple bottom or it could become a false bottom there's all kind of things can happen but wait for some sort of trigger like back here in the metals i think we had a, a little bit of a, a bow tie or something that happened or some individual issues that it was worth a shot steel and iron i think was taken off back then so it was a double bottom and then we had a bow tie so wait for some sort of signal after you recognize a classical technical analysis type of pattern here's a goal goal looks like kind of a quadruple bottom see what i just say triple bottom could become a quadruple bottom which is great but you don't want to rush out and trade it until you get some sort of signal some sort of setup let's take a look at bonds bonds have been a bit of a fly in the ointment for the market, bonds down, as you know, rates up. The good news is they're stabilized a little bit in here, but as you get a big blue arrow so far, still points lower. So hopefully, and you hate to use the word hope when it comes to markets, but hopefully the market will get to stabilize soon. As you would imagine, some areas like real estate not doing too well based on bonds, kind of retraced up to their overhead supply. 
and now they're down here hitting new lows or on their way to new lows. So you obviously want to stay away from real estate. I, but I, I, somebody sent me a setup a couple days ago. It was a REIT. Hey, Dave, want to buy this REIT? Well, okay. Do you really, really like that setup because you're fighting the tide? Okay, and then the market hadn't broken out yet. So you're fighting the tide of a sideways market overall. And then you're also fighting the tide of a down market. So I guess there's no tide in the overall market, so it's not going up or down, but the underlying sector is imploding. So you want to stay away from that. As you would imagine, uh, with the market at new highs, some sectors are at new highs. Uh, drugs just hit new highs, pulled back a little bit in here. Biotech just banged out new highs. Now they're pulling back a little bit in here. Health services or at the process of banging out new highs. In fact, this is uh, this date is about an hour old, but you can see as of an hour ago, they're up at new highs. So, so far, so good there. Um, selected areas within health services, health care plans, home health, uh, at or recently at new highs. You see home health pull back a little bit in here. Uh, back to the downside, transports look abysmal. As you can see, they've kind of retraced back up to their prior trading range in here. Now they're beginning to sell off again. I'm not a Dow theorist. But I do think that it is a pause. I don't think you can completely ignore the transport. Somebody, uh, I think it was Doug Newberry, pointed out that um, the semiconductors are the transports of modern day age. Well, I agree to that to some extent, but you can't completely throw out the transports. But I don't get that excited about Dow Theory. Dow Theory says that you watch the transports to predict the markets. And it might eventually pan out. In this particular case, you do have to watch everything. You can't ignore everything, but you also can't put too much emphasis on any one sector. You can't just say, well, I'm going to trade the transports. If the transports are headed higher, then uh, stocks are headed higher. It, it, but if the transports aren't going higher, I'm not going to trade stocks. Because you might miss a lot of opportunities if you did that. Okay. So don't get too excited about the transports, but idea, but obviously it does score as a negative, and you can't completely ignore it. As you would imagine, a lot of areas, retail, the SIBI, I'm not going to go on and on on these areas because you can look at them on your own. But a lot of areas like the S&P 500 are still stuck in a stupid sideways range. The good news is recently retail, SIBIs, and quite a few other areas did bounce off the bottom of their ranges and so forth, those ranges have hold. The only one that really didn't hold, obviously, would be the semis, okay? Now, let's take a look at, um, let's go ahead and jump out to uh, your stock picks. Okay, Greg wants to know about YDLE. Let's take a look at that. It looks okay, but I do see a problem. And... This is a relatively new issue, so I tend to be a little bit more lenient and less of a perfectionist when it comes to these new issues because you could argue that there's a setup today. I can't talk about the setup. We'll talk about it next week. That has done something similar. That's an actual setup for today. That's mentioned in my trading service. But what kind of jumps out at me is the fact that it broke out and came right back in. Now, the one I'm talking about kind of did this. And then it kind of pulled back to its prior breakout, which if you took the stock selection course, you'll know I'm not a big fan of that. But in this particular case, in this IPO, the reason I still have it as a possible setup is because we got in here. We got partial profits here. We got stopped out. But it still looks like it has potential longer term because of the strong up thrust. But if you look at this one, Okay, it had this little pullback here, and now it's pulled back to the pullback. But if you go back in time a little bit further, you'll also see that on a net-net basis, it hasn't made a whole lot of progress, at least relative to the volatility of the stock. It's up 10%, but that's really not that big of a deal, especially in something like an IPO. And it's got an HV of about 30, so that's really not that big of a move. So I would pass based on the fact that it's pulled all the way back to this prior base in here. And on a net-net basis, it hasn't gone anywhere in a long, long time. 
Now, do keep it on your radar. If it starts banging on new highs, maybe look to pay play pullbacks along the way. James wants to talk about NQ. NQ I like. Uh, this is one that I've been kind of noodling with, kind of thinking about trading. So good eye on that. James, I don't know if you got that from a Landry list recently or not. Uh, it seems like lately I've been putting this stock on my Landry list every day. I don't know if you go back in time. Let me see if I can find it. Let's see. And then when it, right before I publish, yeah, 622. You can see it was on my Landry list a couple days ago. But it seems like last few days, that 642, that was that was published Friday night, I think. So last two, three days, I've been putting this on my Landry list and then taking it off. I've been putting it on because if you zoom in, it's quite beautiful. You've got this beautiful base in here. You've got this nice persistent move higher. There's some acceleration in this move higher, too. It kind of took off kind of slow, and then, bam, began to accelerate higher. I bet you 100 bucks is a bow tie in here. Oh, look at that. Look at that beautiful little bow tie in here. It's got all the makings of an absolutely fantastic setup, okay? Uh, Percentage-wise, what is this thrust from lows to, let's measure the like right there. 75% higher, which is a little ridiculous, but not incredibly ridiculous. It's not like it's going up 500% in five days. And now it's pulled back sharply. You want a sharp pullback, okay? So this is a beautiful setup. So James, fantastic eye on that if you found it on your own, or even if you are uh, picking it off the recent lander list. But every night I take it off the list. Why? Just got all this overhead supply to deal with, okay? So even if it does begin to rally, Human nature is going to uh, put a kibosh on this stock or put a put a little overhead supply on it. It's going to be hard for it to get past this. So for me to get excited about this one, it's got to get have to get past back have to get past eight bucks a share. Believe it or not. Now, I mean, if if you got eight bucks, if it got up to let's say well let's see even to this bottom of this resistance, let's say if it got to seven or so, that's still a pretty good ride as a swing trade. So I can't fault it as a swing trade, but going into a trade, I like to obsess as I preach over and over again. And through that obsession, I want to make sure that the trade has the potential of unlimited gains. Okay. So if I have overhead resistance just above the market, I know that there's a chance it's going to hit that overhead resistance. Remember, those little bars, there are people behind those bars, right? So that represents the trading of people. The trading psychology, or technical analysis, I should say, boils down to taking advantage of the emotions of others while embracing your own. And you're reading those emotions through the chart. There's no rocket science to it. A lot of people bought in that area, and a lot of people be looking out to look at the bailout. Okay. Okay, H O L X for art. Okay, um, this one obviously is in a pretty serious trend. You certainly want to have this on your momentum list, okay? But you need to wait for a pullback before you look to uh, to trade that. Just give me one second to do a little housekeeping here real quick. So, yeah, Art, wait for that... Um, Wait for that to um, pull back before looking to take a trade. BCRX. Okay. Yeah, I had to. Sp I, I want to get my um, list up. So we stay off the list. Um, this one's pretty interesting until you back the chart out. It's not as exciting once you back the chart out. You can see it's kind of wide and loose. And when you zoom in a little bit, it looks pretty darn good. You've got 
kind of a persistent move higher, a pullback, and then acceleration higher, and then a pullback. So that looks fantastic. I think I would pass because you're just barely getting past this old high in here, and it is kind of wide and loose. But shorter term, I agree with you. It looks pretty darn good. Greg, I can't talk about that one. That's on the um, – that's a setup for today in the service. Greg, you're on the service. Um, I'm sorry I can't talk about that. But uh, email me if you want to talk about it. We can do that. Um, but, yeah, if, I, if it's if it's on the service, I like it. It's so funny. It's like, it's like I recommend – I'm not thinking of you, Greg. Uh, but it's like I recommend something, and then somebody – then I get an email. Dave, you like? do you like this one? It's like, yeah, I recommended it. I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't like it. I guess that's human nature to to doubt uh, things. Um, take a look at the HV on this one. It's got an HV of 16. I know the HV in the market's a little low now, uh, but even though it's more than the market, it's still not enough to get too excited. HV of the market is 10. That's what I thought it was. It's amazing because we've gone sideways for so long. So HV is measuring the closes, the changes in the closes, which really aren't that much. And kind of all washes out. So HV is only 10. And I think that's what a one standard deviation chance that the market will be 10% higher or 10% lower a year from now, all things constant. As you know, all things aren't constant when it comes to the market, but it does give you an idea. And this stock doesn't trade much more, bounce around much more than the overall market. I know those numbers get a little skewed when you're looking at 16 versus 10. But Dave, the HV is 60% higher. Well, not really. I guess it's six percent higher the way the way HV is measured. I don't want to get myself into trouble with the math, but I'd rather trade a stock where the HV is much higher than the market right now, at least twice or three times the amount of markets where I'm finding the most opportunities. Um, and it just kind of broke out in here and came back in a little bit. So this is only like a two point move higher in this breakout. And as I often preach, and in fact, I'm writing an article. It's due Monday for uh, Traders Magazine, so I got to get on, get on my, off my butt and do it. But I think last week, a week before, I talked about uh, better the devil you know by trading more vol volatile stocks. And one of my arguments is that at least with a volatile stock, you know it moves around a lot. You're going to have a, a, a wider stop, but you're going to tra trade fewer shares. With a less volatile stock, you're going to have a tighter stop which sounds good on paper, but unfortunately, you're going to have to trade more shares to make it worth your while, okay? And then in doing such, you're going to risk more of your account should something bad happen, and something could happen. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to speculate, but let's say uh, ISIS hacks into MasterCard's computer system. It steals everyone's MasterCard number in the United States. I mean, God forbid. Let's hope nothing like that happens, but something bad could still happen and it doesn't have to be something like that like i talked about before um you know the ceo could decide he wants to shag the secretary the secretary is not too keen on that idea you know so i would avoid it uh hv is too low plus you really don't have much of a trend i mean from um you know let's measure something here let's look at the last so you're going up 1.4 percent in um What's that, about a month and change? I mean, we had stocks. I mean, look at some of the ones we're trading. I mean, like like this one here, going up 66% in the same period of time in a month and change, right? So it, notice the HV much higher. This is the type of stock we're trading as opposed to something that's just going to kind of sit around. CIEN for Howard. Yeah, it looks pretty good, Howard. Um, Let's back the chart out a little bit. It's a big, thick stock. There's a little uh, fluff back here. That's far enough in the past. I wouldn't worry about it. You're almost to that height, so that's okay. Um, it's not bad. The uh, This move is okay. It's not a huge move in here, but it's a decent move relative to the volatility of the stock. It's okay. It is, a, it is a persistent pullback. I'd like a little bit more pullback in here maybe, just a little bit more knockout. But it certainly looks okay. So good eye on that one, Howard. Um, if uh, you were having difficulty trading and you could only trade persistent pullbacks and you said, I traded this stock, good, bad, or indifferent, the, the outcome, depending on the outcome, was good, bad, or indifferent, I would say, well, in perfect hindsight, it was an okay trade to take and focusing on the process versus the outcome. That's okay. 
but maybe a little bit more pullback in this particular case, but it's certainly not bad. I guess the point is I can't beat you up too much. It's just not, it's not jumping out of me as the greatest setup in setup town, but it's certainly not a bad looking stock. Ideally, I like to see maybe a little bit more acceleration uh, in it, but it certainly looks pretty good. Speaking of acceleration, this looks pretty good. Uh, oops, a TC blew up. Talk amongst yourselves. I guess while we wait for that to come back up, let me just show you what I mean by acceleration. That was a decent setup again, Howard, uh, but I, I like to see a little acceleration happen too in an ideal world. So persistent pullback, we're just looking for persistency, which means it tends to go up day after day after day. You can kind of, as um, as Bill McKinney calls it, center line, a trend line. I call it uh just drawing a trend line through the bars. But ideally, in an ideal world, you have persistency. Persistence. I can't spell today. Persistent. Persistency plus acceleration. Okay. Now let's see if that filibustering got the charts back up. All right. So let's take a look at that. A-N-T-H for Greg. Greg usually has a pretty good eye. All right, before we pick it apart too much, let's just see. It looks like it's worked its way higher. It's accelerated higher. It's a persistent tread. It's a knockout move. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Let me see something in here. It's a little it's a little crazy in that it's ran up about a hundred percent over a short period of time. And the volatility is a little high, but the structure is there. Um ideally I'd like to see a little bit more knockout in this knockout move, but it's certainly a viable and okay setup. I can't really argue with it too much. Okay, any more? Well, while we're at an impasse, oh, here we go. Well, Don's here. What, what does Don want to know about? <laughs> what could Don possibly want to know about? Well, it's taken this stock th three months to go one point, and that one point is down. Okay, so three months to go 5% HV of 14, but something bad could always still happen. It's, okay, so take a look at this. This is going to be my poster child. Or something bad happening. So it takes this stock three months to go 5%, but in one day, one day it could drop more than that. So this is this is a poster child or a pretty good um, pretty good idea of of why you gotta be careful trading these stocks that aren't that volatile because something bad could always happen. So in one day this stock moved more than it moved in the past three or four months. So yeah, that's nothing for me here. It's wide and loose, it's still headed down. Oh, we've got a new influx of uh, people. Calvin, I can't pull that one up on this computer because it's uh, it's Toronto. You, is there an American equivalent? F is a short here. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I hear you, but I'd be careful shorting it, uh, Phil. I don't know, yeah. You know, if I had to short something, I would much rather short a lower uh, a lower volatility, more efficient stock. We're, we're short UAL right now, for instance. And I don't know, the HV is up there pretty much, but it is a more efficient stock, okay? Because the, the, the explosions are much more dangerous to the downside than the upside in these lower volatility, low volatile stocks. But there's still, there's always still a danger that if you're trading a less volatile stock, that it could have that, that, that so-called Black Swan event, as Talib calls him. Yeah, I hear you, Phil. Phil's traded a 50-day moving average off of that. I hear you. Let's just punch it up for S and Gs. Let's throw a 50 in there. So 200. 
Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, Phil likes to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. This. I don't know if this is exact system, but I know he likes to look for that daylight and a little throwback to the 50 to short it, which is a which is a viable thing. It, you know, everything works better with trend. That's a good little trend following system. Let's see something here. Greg, I think you're on the list again, buddy. You got to stay off the list. Yeah, you're on the list. You can't uh you can't work off the list. What I'm saying is you can't. I have a, a list that I put out for my people. And um I don't want to talk about those stocks, okay? We can't out, out of the out of the Oh, you're not on the service anymore. Well, good eye then, Greg. Okay, Greg used to be on the service. Okay, I'm sorry, Greg. I didn't mean to beat you up. Greg used to be on the service, and I guess I taught him well because uh, he's picking the exact stocks that we're looking at today. So good job on that, Greg. All right, I thought you were, like, looking at the – I thought it was one of those cases where this um, human brain thing's coming in where this human action reaction where, hey, I like this stock. Hey, Dave, what do you think about that stock? I told you I liked it. <laughs> what, you want me to scream it at you? Uh, so, okay, so sorry to pick on you, Greg. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's good then. You're on, you're on the list, so congratulations. Okay, um, I think that's it for today. Any questions, you know the team, daviddavelander.com. I have a blast doing these shows. I appreciate everybody showing up, uh, all you guys and girls. Anything unanswered, just shoot me an email, and then um, I guess I'll see you guys uh, next week. Frank, we just covered that one a few minutes ago. Uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Everybody have a fantastic weekend, and um, I'll see you next week. Thank you so much.